Well, hello, friends here in Oakville and across all of our sites. First of all, will you welcome our newly adopted family member, John Mark Comer? <laughs> Good morning. Uh, Great to I see you. I'm so glad that we get to hang out together today. I'm going to say a couple of things. First of all, we've just finished a four-week series on peace and reconciliation. And then next week, we are starting a new series called Three Beautiful Words. And we'll, I'll let that sit with you as you figure out what those three beautiful words are. And we're going to um, begin that series. But this is a perfect Sunday for us just to pause and hear from God and just say, how are we doing? And uh, John Mark Comer is going to do a great job. This message is for you, I'm sure. The other thing I'm going to say is that uh, he's from the States, and you know in Canada we have a reputation of being a little more staid, and then in the Brethren in Christ we're even more staid, and then here at the Meeting House we're like half dead. So what I, what I, what I just want to say is that he may be used to a little more feedback. Now I've told him, as Canadians, we say we honor everything you say by staying very quiet and not moving so we don't cause distraction. But can you just speak his love language this morning and feel free to hoot, holler, cheer, or just say amen. It's a handy word to use as he, yes? All right. Oh Great. Well, gosh. let's quickly pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that over the next few minutes you would open up our hearing that we might hear from you. And thank you for what our brother's going to teach us. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said? Amen. There Way you are. Thank go. you. Thanks for that hospitality, Bruxy. Good morning, everybody. It really, it, and you said something back to me. <laughs> Wow, well done. It really is an honor to be here. I've been watching you and your community and Bruxine is teaching for a number of years now and uh, I've been kind of on a very similar journey to, as Bruxy toward this kind of Anabaptist vision of church and so it's really an honor. I'm, my, I have a selfish motivation to be here. I really want to learn from you more than I want to teach but um, I'm supposed to say something. So please turn your Bibles to Mark chapter five. Mark chapter five, I hear you are in a year-long conversation about Jesus and how he would relate to people far from God. And so let me just introduce one more piece into that year-long conversation. Let's start off in Mark chapter five. Take a look at verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered round him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. This is a crisis. It's like one of those phone call in the middle of the night kind of emergency. A large crowd, though, followed and pressed around Jesus. And a woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, okay, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. She felt in her body she was freed from her suffering. How beautiful is that? Now at once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and he asked, who touched my clothes? Now can you imagine, just pause for a minute, if you're Jairus right now, how do you feel? You're like, Jesus, she's about to die, we need to go, hurry up, come on, what like, who cares who touched you, just come on. And you see the people, 31, crowding against you, the disciples answered, and yet you asked, who touched me? Jesus, what, come on, we have to go. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. There's a pause in the story. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. And he said, daughter, I'm late to heal somebody. I'm in a hurry. Come on, why are you slowing me down? That's, no, that's not in the original language, I promise. He said, daughter, quote, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Turn to the right to Luke chapter 10, another story. In Luke 10, Jesus tells a story. Verse 30, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So here's the you know, first century equivalent of a pastor 
on his way to, you know, work at the meeting house, but he's late for their 8 a.m. morning gathering. And so I just, sorry, there's somebody I need inside of the world. I don't have time. I'm in a hurry. Got to go. So two, 32, a Levite. That's kind of like the next level down, the underlane, right? When he passed by, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side as well. But then a Samaritan. Now, if you're a first century Jew and you're hearing this story, a Samaritan is the enemy, not the friend. It's the equivalent of a, I don't know, an Al-Qaeda terrorist or something for us today. A Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity. He's the hero. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, I'll pay everything back. Then Jesus has this to say, 36. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the Torah replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said what? Go and do likewise. The hero in the story is the man who slowed down long enough to help somebody in need. One more, turn over to John chapter 11. To the right in your Bible, John chapter 11, verse one. Now a man named Lazarus was ill. He was from Bethany, this village where Mary and her sister Martha were from. Three, So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one that you love is ill. One of your best friends is sick and at the point of death. When Jesus heard this, he said, this illness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Notice he's not all stressed out. Now Jesus loved Martha Martha and her sister Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he jumped into his car, hit the freeway, broke the speed limit, got a ticket on the ray, but he just, as fast as he could, he got there in time. Nope, not there. It says he stayed where he was two more days, not in a rush. And then he said to his disciples, let's now go back to Judea. And the story goes on. One of the first things that you notice about Jesus when you read the four biographies about him in the New Testament is that he was rarely, if ever, in a hurry. One of my favorite theologians was once asked to describe Jesus in one word. Thought about it for a minute, and then do you know what he said? He said, relaxed. If you had one word to describe Jesus, Like, is relaxed what comes to mind? But think about it. Can you imagine a stressed out Jesus? Like, it's a bit hard, right? You imagine him just kind of on edge and grouchy and like, come on, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. And like, late, I'm at the meeting house, you know, in the morning, but I got a speaking gig in Quebec that night, gotta catch a flight. And he's walking out the door, like with his body man or whatever, uh, to the limo. This is all hypothetical, right? And and you're there and you're like, I need a healing, I need a prayer, I just need to say hello to you, Jesus. And he's like, yeah, what? Okay, and he's kind of like, you know the, when somebody's half on the phone, half texting, half talking to you, kind of not doing either well, you know what I'm saying? And kind of like, ah, what? I gotta go, I'm so, this is Thaddeus, he's a disciple nobody's ever heard of, but he's staying behind, he'll pray with you, I gotta catch a flight, bye, you know? We laugh because that's just so not Jesus. Jesus, in story after story, was present to the moment. Present, attentive, all the way in, each and every moment. Present to God, our Father who is in heaven. That word heaven is oranos in Greek. It's actually plural. It's better translated, the heavens. Don't think the place you go when you die. Think the air or the atmosphere all around you as close as the air up against your skin or even in your lung cavity. Our Father, right here, right now. That's the idea. Present to the person in front of him. How long has he been like this? Jesus would regularly ask questions, dialogue, interact. Present to the world. Look at the birds of the air. Look at that flower over in the field. Present to beauty. Present to his own body and even his own soul. Father, my soul is deeply troubled right now. Jesus put on display a non-hurried, present way of life. What does it mean for you and I as followers or if you prefer apprentices, it's a better translation I think than disciples, of Jesus of Nazareth? Well, 
I think for starters, it means that to follow Jesus, to apprentice under him, to learn from Jesus how to do this whole human thing, is to match your pace of life to his. Um, I'm kind of anti-Christian cliche, but there's one that I still love and still use all the time, and it's to walk with God. I love that word picture. Not to run with God or sprint with God or jet set with God, but to walk with God. That's to follow Jesus is to walk with God, to match your pace of life, to live by what Eugene Peterson called the rhythms of grace, which for most of us means we need to slow down because this hurry, this busyness, this rush, this frenetic pace, it robs us of the capacity to be present to God, to the person in front of us, a child, a coworker, somebody in need on the side of the road, literally or metaphorically, to the world around us in a beautiful winter day, to our own body and soul. One of the first things that you notice about older, wiser followers of Jesus, and there are some in the room here who've been following Jesus longer than I've been alive, is most of them move much slower. I used to think it as a young guy, you think it's because people are old or something like that. And now I start to realize, what if it's because people are wise? Because they've caught on to something that so far I have still missed. I have this mentor, John, um, he's not actually my mentor, he would balk if he heard me say that, um, but we've had lunch a number of times, we have another lunch on the calendar, and my working theory, you can't ask somebody like that to be your mentor because all the good ones are taken and they'll say no, and so what I do is I just like, I sneak in, hey, can I have lunch with you? I have 10 questions I wanna ask, I'll make it one hour, I'll make it worth your time, and everybody says yes, okay, I can do that, they feel nice or whatever, and then I figure if we do it enough times, he'll just wake up one day and be realized, dang, I got sucked into mentoring this nobody from Portland, all right? So that's my secret plan. And um, John uh, is this amazing guy. He's this world famous pastor, Bible teacher, writer, and uh, IRL, as kids say these days, in, in real life, he's just everything you would dream. He's smart as a whip and well read and sophisticated, but not at all pretentious, very down to earth and comfortable in his own skin and self aware. He's just like who I want to be kind of when I grow up. And he tells this great story about his mentor, who was the philosopher Dallas Willard, whose writings have shaped my understanding of what it means to follow Jesus more than anybody else outside of the Bible. And he tells this story about back in the 90s, John was on staff at one of the most influential megachurches in the world. And uh, kind of well-known, best-selling author by then, all of that, but he was just getting sucked into the hurry and the busyness and the emotional unhealth of that church culture, and he just felt stuck in his own transformation. And so he calls up his mentor and says, Dallas, I, I'm stuck. How do I move forward and, and get healthy again and do this whole life thing? And he says there was a long silence on the other side of the line, because with Willard there was almost always a long silence, and then Willard said just two sentences. He said this, hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Now John wrote that down, that's amazing. This is before Twitter or it would have like broke the internet, you know, but that's amazing, thank you. And then he said, what else? Another long silence. And then Willard said, there is nothing else. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. When I first heard that story, it, it struck a chord like at a deep part of me because that's not how I would have answered that question. I live in the urban core of uh, Portland, Oregon, one of the most progressive cities in all of America. Uh, it's a really challenging place to follow Jesus and do church and all. I love it, but it's hard. And if you were to ask me, hey, what's the greatest challenge that you face following Jesus in this post-Christian, secular, blah, 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 urban kind of environment, I don't know what I would say. The redefinition of sexuality or military violence or Donald Trump or I don't even know what I would say. But I would not have put hurry on the list, much less at the top of the list. But the longer I think about it, the more I come to believe this is true. The greatest enemy of spiritual life in our day not through human history, but in our day, in our age, is this thing of hurry. I mean, if you think about it, um, the Satan doesn't have to show up as a demon with a pitchfork on your shoulder as much as the dopamine rush that you get from your phone or another hour at the office 
or another yes instead of a no or commitment after commitment after commitment in your already over busy life half it to do with church. The famous psychologist Carl Jung who developed this idea of introverts and extroverts whose work was the basis for Myers-Briggs, he had this line, hurry isn't of the devil, it is the devil. I think there's truth in that. We spent the last few years kind of reworking the architecture of our church around this idea of transformation. And before we launched it with our community, I sat down with a PhD in town who was a therapist, brilliant, Jesus-loving guy that I really respect, who does this for a living. And I ran the whole kind of vision by him, and at the end he said, okay, basically had very little to say. He said, it's great. Um, He said, the number one problem you will face is time. People are just too busy to live emotionally healthy and spiritually awake. And as a pastor, over the last, I have come to believe, oh my gosh, that is 110% true. Michael Zigarelli from the Charleston University School of Business did a survey of 20,000 Christians in North America. So it's not a small sample set. And he identified busyness as the major distraction to people's life with God. He said this, here's his survey, quote, it may be the case that one, Christians are assimilating a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload, which leads to two, God becoming more marginalized in Christians' lives, which leads to three, a deteriorating relationship with God, which leads to four, Christians becoming even more vulnerable to adopting secular assumptions about how to live, which leads to five, more conformity to a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload, and then the cycle begins again. Does that sound at all familiar, that cycle of life? Have a look at this from Ronald Rollheiser, my favorite Catholic writer, who's actually from the Toronto area. He writes this. Today, a number of historical circumstances are blindly flowing together and accidentally conspiring to produce a climate within which it is difficult not just to think about God or to pray, but simply to have any interior depth whatsoever. We are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion, pathological busyness, distraction, and restlessness are major blocks today within our spiritual lives. I love that turn of phrase, pathological busyness. The need of the hour is for a slow down spirituality. We all know that the world has sped up, at least I think we know in the back of our mind, okay, the world is faster than it used to be. Let me just nerd out on you for three minutes with a brief history lesson, all right? Just let me unleash your inner history channel love, which most of you don't have, all right? So ironically, the clock was invented by the monastery. Did you know that? St. Benedict in the sixth century came up with this idea of fixed hour prayer and seven times a day. It's a bit hard to do without a clock. So the clock was actually invented by monks, but it wasn't until 1370 that historians kind of point to as the turning point in the West's relationship with time. That was the year the first public clock was ever, outside of a monastery, was ever erected in Cologne, Germany, and it marked a shift in the West's relationship to time. Before that, time was artificial, was um, more natural it was seasonal. Um, you think it was connected to the earth and its you know, point on its axis and the seasons of time. Days were longer in summer and shorter in winter and there were seasons of harvest and hard work and seasons of more kind of Sabbath. But after that, time became much more artificial. We think about the slog of the nine to five, like summer to winter and everything in between. And it made us far more efficient but also turned us into a bit more machine and a bit less human being. Then in 1879, you have Thomas Edison and the light bulb, which did a number on our time for rest. So um, before Edison, the average North American, did you know this, slept 10 to 11 hours every single night. Right, so we read about, you ever read ancient biographies or older biographies of like great men and women of the faith who got up at 4 a.m. to pray and you think, that's amazing. They went to bed at six, all right? (laughs) It's not that amazing. You would have been up early too, right? Now the average North American is down to seven hours a night. Just think about three or four hours less of sleep a day. Then about a century ago, technology started to change our relationship to time yet again through so-called labor-saving devices. So this is you know, Canada, it's cold, in case you're not aware of that. For those of us from where mortal people live, it's very cold, all right? 
And um, I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I know winter, but you just take it to a whole other level here. That's all I have to say. So it used to be if you wanted to survive in Canada in winter, you had to go out or anywhere. You had to go out into the forest and you had to like cut a tree down without a chainsaw with like a your bare hands and a rock or whatever and cut it up and drag it back to your cabin and light it on fire just to survive the wilderness or whatever. Now, I woke up this morning, it was a bit chilly in my hotel room and so I got out of bed and I walked to the wall and I pushed the arrow that pointed up three times and heat just started to come up out of the floor like magic, it's amazing. I didn't even have to take three days and go cut down a tree and drag it back to my hotel room, not at all. We used to have to walk everywhere, now we can drive or fly. We used to have to write letters and wait for months. Now I can, yesterday I was texting with my friend in England, like back and forth in one day. So we were more efficient than we've ever been before. We've saved all of this time, yet in spite of our dishwasher and laundry machine and toaster and microwave, we all feel like we have less time, not more. In the 1960s, you know, all sorts of social theorists, you can go read this stuff, it's hilarious, it's like funny to read. We're all predicting The main problem in the future would not be too much work, it would be too much leisure. It's a famous true story about a Senate subcommittee under Richard Nixon in 1967 that predicted by 1985, the average American would only work 22 hours a week and for 27 weeks a year. Maybe in France, but not in, no. Can can you make French jokes in Canada? I think no. I think that was just a blunder. Edit that out of the podcast, right? That goes over well where I'm from, trust me. Um, this is hilarious, you know, but the actual leisure time since the 70s has gone down, I read another study, by 37% in North America. Over the same time period, you see the death of the Sabbath, 7-11 started in 1969. My dad, who's 67, uh, we're from the Bay Area of California, tells stories about growing up in what is now Silicon Valley on Sunday and every single thing was closed except the church. And then 7-Eleven opened. He remembers that day. I just, can you imagine Silicon Valley now closing down one day a week? Now, all of this reached a kind of fever pitch in 2007. When the history books are written, they will point to 2007 as just as key of an inflection point as 1440. 1440, of course, was the year that Gutenberg invented the printing press, which launched the Protestant Reformation, which transformed Europe and the world. And 2007 was the year that Steve Jobs, I know he's a bit of a dirty figure up here in Blackberry world, but that he launched the iPhone out into the wild. It was the official start date, not only of the smartphone, it was also the year that Facebook became global, Twitter became global, it was the beginning of the iCloud, the App Store, Intel switched to silicon chips. It's the kind of the official start date of the digital age. And more than anything, the smartphone, the last decade, that's all it's been, has changed what it means to be human just like cutting edge studies coming out now on how it's rewiring our neurobiology and decreasing, if not demolishing, our capacity for attention, focus, even our ability to, like Jesus, be present. Think about what the implications of this are for our relationship to Jesus or to other people. Psychologists argue that most North Americans, most Westerners' relationship to their phone falls into the category of compulsion. We have to check that text. We have to check that email. We have to look at the alert. If not full-on addiction, which is defined as, quote, the relentless pull to a substance or an activity that becomes so compulsive it ultimately interferes with everyday life. By that definition, nearly every single person I know, myself included, is addicted in some measure to their phone or to the internet. And if you don't think you're a digital addict, prove it. Turn off your smartphone for a full 24 hours, see how long you make it until you're writhing on the floor, foaming at the mouth, going through withdrawals, all right? Prove it to me and to yourself. All that to say, history lesson over, all that to say, I would argue that something has gone deeply wrong in our culture. Mental health professionals are now talking about hurry sickness, which is now categorized in DSM, the manual, which is, quote, a behavior pattern characterized by continual rushing or anxiousness. Most people in the West now live with a low-grade anxiety that rarely, if ever, goes away. Psychology Today defines it as a malaise in which a person feels chronically short of time. Anybody out there? and so tends to perform every task faster and to, do, and to get flustered when encountering any kind of delay. I read one psychologist who uh, gave a self-diagnosis like, here's a little test to take to see if you have hurry sickness or not. Three things, one, you move from one checkout line to another because it's shorter. 
you know who you are. <laughs> Two, when you come to a stoplight, you count the cars ahead of you and then change lanes to the shortest one. Yeah, any guilt and shame in the room right now? I just agree with that. Um, kidding, I'm kidding. Three, you multitask to the point that you forget one of the tasks. Anybody ever? Not to play armchair psychologist, but I'm pretty sure we all have hurry sickness. And hurry is a form of violence on the soul. Ruth Haley Barton has a great 10 signs that you're moving too fast through life. When I first read this, it just wrecked me. One is irritability, like you're just quick to lose your temper or kind of get, you know, cagey or uptight, especially with people that you're close to a spouse or children or roommate or close coworker. Two is hypersensitivity. You're just really fast to like, oh, what do you mean? You get offended or angry too easy. Three is restlessness. When you finally do slow down to rest, you can't. You can't relax because your body is like, you're, you carry this anxiety, you carry this speed in your body, in your neurobiology. And so your mind is racing and you can't, you're fidgety and you reach for your phone or you turn on the TV. You have to have stimulation. You can't take the quiet. Four is compulsive overworking. You just stay, you gotta work another thing, you gotta do this other thing, you gotta accomplish, you gotta accumulate. Five is numbness. You just don't have the capacity to feel anymore, specifically empathy. You just don't have any emotion left over for somebody else. You don't have time for that. Sixth is escapist behaviors. You just get sucked into, you know, binge watching Netflix or whatever it is for you because you don't actually have the emotional energy to do what is actually life-giving for your soul. And so you just veg out. Seventh is disconnected from our identity and calling. You forget who you are and what you were called to do with your short, wild, beautiful life. And so you just get sucked into the tyranny of the urgent or more than likely the trivia and, and worthlessness of so much of our entertainment-based culture. Eighth is not able to attend to human needs, uh, like time to exercise, to sleep enough, to rest, to eat healthy. Nine is hoarding energy, like you just, you don't have energy to give to other people because you're just like, you gotta hoard it. And then tenth is slippage in spiritual practices. The very practices that are the, the way that we connect with God, prayer, scripture, a meal with our community, church on Sunday, some time alone just to be present to God, like these are the first things that are often to go. We just don't have time, we don't have energy, we're in a rush, we, we gotta move on. So we have a problem, time, and listen, the solution is not more time. And you all know this is true, like just think about it. I will regularly catch myself saying something like, man, I just wish there were 10 more hours in a day, or I just wish there were three more days in a week, or anybody ever say that? That is so Foolish, every time I catch myself saying that, I think, just think about the, the logic of that. If the universe were reshaped and all of a sudden there were 10 more hours in a day or three more days in a week, what would we do? Yes, if you're anything like me, or what's your name? Trina. Trina then we would just fill up those hours with the exact same stuff that we're doing now, but even more of it. And at the end of the day or the end of the week, we'd be even more exhausted than we are now. It's God's mercy that he put a limit on the number of hours in a day and days in a week. So the solution is not more time, it's to slow down and to simplify our life around what really matters. Not to add, but to subtract. Often people hear about the spiritual disciplines, they hear about Jesus, they come to church, and it just sounds like one more thing or 10 more things to do on top of my already over busy life. It's because we're trying to live and then cram Jesus into our crazy busy life and it just does not work. It makes Jesus a burden or a legalistic guilt trip or another thing rather than the way to be human. We have to, as Thoreau so wisely said, live deliberately. One of the ways we do this is through the practices of Jesus or what in church tradition are called the spiritual disciplines. These are time-tested ways of ancient ways of being in apprenticeship to Jesus. They're not legalistic guilt trip and a to-do list and an earning you gotta add on. These are how you follow Jesus, how you not only survive, but how you thrive as a human being in a very hard and challenging world. Here are the four kind of top practices that for me um, are helpful in the fight against hurry. And there's more, but here's my short list. One is Sabbath. What if you, what if I were to Take a whole day a week, just like Jesus did, to rest and worship. Think about that, one-seventh of Jesus' life 
was spent doing nothing but resting and worshiping. I do this with my family every Friday night to Saturday evening and it's the highlight of our week. We turn off all of our phones, turn off all of our computers and we power everything down. We come around a table, we light a candle, we start with a giant meal, we laugh, we talk, we debrief the week, we go to bed early like pre-Thomas Edison early and we sleep, we get up, we eat some more, we just kind of eat our way, that's kind of how we do it, Comer style. I, I'm an introvert, so I go off for hours to read and pray and think and process. And my wife's an extrovert, she'll go out to have coffee with her best friend or whatever. It's just a day for, for God, for our own soul, our own body, for our family. It's just a day for what really matters. And the beauty of Sabbath is it's like a governor on the overall speed of my entire life. Old Testament theologian Walter Brueggemann has this great line, people who keep Sabbath live all seven days differently. There's something beautiful about that. Like no matter how busy my week is, I know I have this whole day coming every seventh to slow down, to rest, to worship, to remember, to recenter, to recalibrate. Second practice is silence and solitude, which is put simply just intentional time in the quiet to be alone with yourself and with God. Jesus did this all the time. You read story after story. He'd get up early or he'd stay up late or he'd disappear into the wilderness for weeks at a time just to be with himself and to be with God and to process his feelings before God. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, slipping away just to pray and weep and doubt and lament and vent to God. We need space to slip, especially those of us, this is harder for extroverts, but often they need it even more because you have to slow down long enough to, how am I actually doing? What am I actually thinking and feeling? Because that's where we so often meet God, is in the place of pain. But so often we just rush and we busy, we move through life because we're scared to go to the place of pain, yet that's where we find life with God. Third is um, the practice of simple living or what secular society likes to call minimalism now. Um, you've been doing this for a very long time in your tradition of the church, it's beautiful. And yes, if you're a cynic in the room and new to this tradition, um, yes, this is just for rich people. Poor people don't call it simple living, they just call it living. But most of us in the room are not poor. And so the invitation is just to strip your life down to what really matters. Go through your house or your apartment and just get rid of all the clutter, all the stuff you don't need. How many pairs of shoes do you honestly need, right? How many jackets? Oh, in Canada, you probably need quite a few, but whatever. <laughs> do you actually need, just strip it down and then do the same to your schedule, your activities, your hobbies. Are you really that into model trains? Like, do you need it? You do it once a year. Do you really need that? Like, whatever it is, and you just strip it down because you believe that will make your be life better, not worse because you don't buy the Western materialistic mantra that was invented by madmen in New York City to sell you stuff to make money for other rich people. You know that, that, that narrative, more stuff equals more happiness, it's not true. In fact, it's a bit of a lie and you believe the narrative of Jesus, which was radically different. Jesus' view of money, of possessions, of what really made for the good life what really made for anxiety and what really made for peace was radically different. So either Jesus is wrong and marketing is right and we should ignore Jesus and go buy more stuff to be happier or Jesus was on to something that a lot of people don't want you to believe in because they want to make money off of you. Man, don't fall prey to it. Believe Jesus. His story is so much better. It's so much truer and it is really the pathway to life. Finally is the practice, or um, this is kind of a newer spiritual discipline. I would argue it's just as ancient, but nobody talked about it until recently. I think it was because it was assumed. But Richard Foster, John Orberg, a number of great teachers of the way have started to write about this, what they call the spiritual discipline of slowing. Because a spiritual discipline is just to do what Jesus did. And he moved slowly through life. And so I think the working theory is slow down your body, slow down your whole life, right? And so they're just little fun, playful, non-legalistic rhythms and rituals or even rules that we can play around with to slow down our body and slow down our life. So here I have a, like a running kind of list for me on my Evernote file. Here's a few off of it. I'm driving the speed limit, which is actually a law too, so that's, that's 
gets helpful to obey it. Um, I'm from the West Coast. This is all kind of, we, we kind of obey the law when we're in the mood. Um, secondly, come to a full stop at a stop sign. I think there's a law about that somewhere too, not in California where I'm from, but whatever. Third is get in the slow lane just for fun. So I'll do this. I'll just sometimes like, um, I don't drive, it's easy for me because I don't drive much or live in the city, but when I do, so it's kind of like, I get in the slow lane. All these like stressed out people and expensive cars flying by me and I just, what will it gain a person to gain the whole world but lose their soul, you know? And I'm just, I'm rocking my soul in the slow lane with grandma and the minivan in front of me. It's just, I know it's a bit self-righteous, but whatever, I'm, I'm in process, you know? Um, turn off your phone. A while ago, a couple years ago, I started turning my phone off and my wife does the same at 8.30 every night. Don't turn it back on until 9.30 every morning. Ah, what a gift. Um, walk slower. Like literally walk slower. Talk slower. Just catch yourself. Um, I have this really, this is a really fun one. If you just want to torture yourself, you're in a kind of masochistic mood, next time you're at the grocery store, deliberately find the longest line, <laughs> get there, and don't touch your phone. And just, just, just pay attention. Just do it this afternoon. Just pay attention to how that feels in your body, how it feels in your mind, what it feels like to not have a phone to check and look and answer and da-da-da. Like I'm just, I'm 37. I'm just old enough to remember this thing from the 90s that we called boredom. <laughs> like I remember when you'd be in line at a coffee shop and there'd be six people in front of you and you would just stand in line. And extroverts would talk to people, and those of us that aren't extroverted would just be bitter at the rest of you. Why are you talking to me? I don't know you. I don't want to know you. I'm fine, okay? I don't need. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, not a lot of us, but whatever. All right, so now, I mean, what, we reach for the appendage that is our phone, and we answer an email, or we text, or we check the weather, or we read about what did he do this time in the news, or whatever. Like, you know, something like we just, all of those little moments, we laugh, and boredom was so lousy. But yet, all of these little moments, standing in line, stuck in traffic, at a red light, on a plane flight, all of these little moments of boredom were potential portals to prayer. Little opportunities, little open doors to come back to our body, our soul, and to come back to our awareness of and connection to the Spirit of God. What happens when all of those potential portals are swallowed up by the phone, by the internet, by the podcast, by the radio? They're just all gone. All silence is gone. All prayer. It's just all, sw what is left? Two hours on a Sunday where you come and try to remember God? 10, hour, 10 minutes in the morning where you read a psalm and try to remember God before you get sucked. If that's all that's left, that is just a tiny fraction of the life that God has for you. This isn't guilt, this isn't shame, this isn't none of this, this isn't judgment, this is invitation. The invitation of Jesus is to take his, what he called his yoke on your life. Ancient followers of Jesus called it a rule of life. Don't get turned off by that language of a rule. It was from this Greek word that just was the word for a trellis. Think of a vineyard. Think of Jesus teaching about abiding in the vine to bear much fruit. For a vineyard to grow and thrive, it has to have a trellis underneath the vine. For you to grow and thrive and experience God and bear fruit and become the person that deep in the marrow of your bones you know you were made to be, you have to have a trellis. You have to have a structure, a schedule, and a set of practices to undergird your life with God. It won't just happen in the busyness and craziness and insanity of our life. We have to even schedule it in. Stephen Covey of 90s Daytime Refrain said that we achieve inner peace when our schedule is aligned with our values. That's not in the Bible, but it sounds like it would be, right? I think Jesus would be down with that. And so to end, I just want to invite you. I've been on this journey now for two or three years, and it is hard. I live in a city. I have a smartphone, I travel, I'm raising three kids, I work a demanding job, I, I'm right in the middle of it. It is hard in our day and age to live this way, but all of the really good things in life are hard. And it is worth every scrap of effort, intentionality, be patient with yourself. If you go on this slowing down journey, give yourself a lot of grace. But I think that if Jesus were here, and you were to hang out with him this afternoon, he would move much slower 
and I think there would be, you would find your own heartbeat start to slow down, your pulse, you'd start to feel yourself come back present to God, to the person in front of you, to the moment. This year conversation you're in around evangelism, so many of the best moments in life are interruptions. If you're a parent with a child, if you're a worker with your coworker, with a neighbor, with somebody on the side of the road, literally or metaphorically, what happens when you hurry your life to this fever pitch is you miss those best moments. You're not even there for them or you skim over the surface of them and you never actually experience what God had for you with that person in that moment, that two-year-old, that neighbor, that hallway conversation at work. And you, these were opportunities that could have been a moment for somebody to meet with God or for you to meet with somebody or for you to display the love of the Father or, the, like, or these are the moments of life the interruptions that we have to slow down and create space to be present for. To end, let's read this invitation from, this is from Jesus and the Gospel of Matthew, but from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of it. Would you just, I know it's Canada, but can you read out loud with me? Can you do that? Nice and loud, read this with me to end. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this people, for this family. And I just ask that you as the father, I think of all the books written by psychologists and sociologists on leadership theory about how the emotional and character reality of the leader is distilled down through the entire company or organization. Pray that would be true for this family. You, Father, your emotional disposition, your character of this unhurried, present way of life, I pray that it would just sink and seep even deeper down into this community. I thank you for this long-running tradition they have of simplicity and slowing and the good life. And may they continue to be a city on a hill, God, for churches on the other side of our continent, hearing about this way of life, hearing about people who take the teachings of Jesus seriously and flesh it out in a community. May your blessing be on and in and through this community as the light of the world to the nations. Amen. Hi, I'm Brexy. Thanks for tracking with the Meeting House teaching. If you want to see more videos by us, just click right here. If you want to see what our youth and our kids are learning, you click here. And if you want to be notified anytime we post a new video to make sure you don't miss a teaching, then you subscribe by clicking right here. Thanks again for tracking with us.